We welcome you to the ANU International Law Society Kura Series, Unraveling International Law. We acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, traditional custodians of the lands on which this interview was recorded. We pay our respects to Elders, past, present and emerging, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers. We hope you enjoy Episode 8. My name is Freya Cox and I'm the 2022 Careers Director for the Australian National University International Law Society. To begin the second season of our career video series, Unraveling International Law, we are delighted to have a highly eminent guest, Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, ACQC, joining us. Thank you so much for making the time to speak to us today, Professor Evans. My pleasure, Freya. Professor Evans has had an exceptionally distinguished career. He's had an extensive career in Australian politics, including as Attorney General of Australia and Minister for Foreign Affairs for Australia from 1988 to 1996. He was the President and CEO of the International Crisis Group, a Brussels-based global conflict prevention and resolution organisation from 2000 to 2009. He has co-chaired the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty and currently co-chairs the International Advisory Board of the Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect. He's also been Chancellor of our very own Australian National University from 2010 to 2019. Welcome, Gareth. Thanks again. So I would like to start off by talking about your career. You began your career as an academic where you specialised in constitutional law and civil liberties law, then as a barrister where you specialised in industrial law. You then spent over two decades in Australian politics. In your 2017 memoir, Incorrigible Optimist, you write that during your years as foreign affairs minister, international relations became your consuming preoccupation and has remained so ever since. Could you please speak about what attracted you to international affairs and your career pathway into international relations? Well, I guess I was always interested in other countries and other cultures, but what really made that interest real and immediate was a whole series of visits I was able to do during my basically undergraduate and university days. First of all, to Japan in 1964, visiting Hiroshima just 20 years after the uh, atomic bomb blast and standing at the epicenter of that and just realizing the awful the inhumanity that was involved. Uh, going on a uh, US State Department uh, student leader trip to the United States and uh, one of their more counterproductive investments because I came back a very fierce opponent of the Vietnam War, uh, but then uh, traveling more or less overland to, um, to Oxford in 1968 through uh, Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, through South Asia, through the Horn of Africa, Middle East, Europe, and really multiplying a whole set of formative experiences on the way, which really stayed with me and uh, have energized me really ever since. Um, professionally, I wasn't really preoccupied with international affairs at all until much, much later. Uh, my preoccupation was as a, as a lawyer, a domestically focused uh, lawyer. I had studied international law, but just as one subject among many others at Melbourne Law School. But, um, you know, I really wanted to be, when I got into politics, Attorney General, that was the, the great ambition. I was passionately involved in human rights, um, civil liberties issues, Indigenous uh, Aboriginal legal services and so on during my, uh, my early adulthood. And that was my major preoccupation, uh, law reform, constitutional issues and so on. But when the, uh, when politics uh, arrived and I got involved and, I was a member of the Hawke uh, Hawk Keating government and um, life moved on. And when uh, Hawke asked me to become um, you know, foreign minister and then Bill Hayden became uh, governor general, I really, really jumped at the opportunity because that was my, uh, you know, my underlying, I guess, real love. And um, certainly it was uh, a bit of a dream fulfilled to, uh, to move into that role. I think you'll be inspiring lots of ANU students to go traveling again when that's possible. Well, I want to talk about that later on when we when we come to sort of the you know career prescriptions and how you position yourself because those those early travel experiences were just incredibly formative as I describe in my memoir they they stick with you. And one of the great tragedies of COVID, of course, is that's been denied to so many young people at this really critical stage of their career. But no doubt we'll come back to that. Absolutely. 
In Incorrigible Optimist, you also write that the seven and a half years you spent as Australia's foreign affairs minister, being a central part of that diplomatic action, was the most exciting and productive period of your professional life. What did you enjoy most about your role as foreign affairs minister and what did you find most challenging? Well, coming into the job as I did in the late 1980s and through the end of the Cold War and the, right through the, uh, the 90s, um, as I described in my, my memoir, it, uh, channeling William Wordsworth, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive and to be foreign minister was the very heaven. Uh, the reason was the sense of possibility was just so huge at that stage. The, 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 the ice flows of the, um, the Cold War period in terms of cooperation by the major powers on big issues uh, really seemed to have melted. The opportunity was there to um, do some major you know, problem solving. And, uh, and you know, we, we made the most of it. I mean, Australia uh, really played um, a very important creative role as a, as a middle power, as we've always been capable of doing, but we haven't done it all that often, as much often as we should have, building coalitions around big um, global public goods issues. So the things that um, I'm really, with the highlights, I suppose, of my, my eight years as foreign minister were the, uh, the Cambodia peace settlement, which we were, played a central role in, um, in conceptualizing and negotiating. It was the uh, development of Asia Pacific regional security and economic cooperation architecture, APEC, the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, all of which gave enormous hope at that stage that we were moving into a new area of era of cooperative uh, activity. Um, we played a big role in, uh, in international arms control issues, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which had been uh, locked in uh, fruitless negotiation for 20 years. So we were the key to, to unlocking that. Uh, and nuclear issues, we uh, initiated right at the end of my, uh, my period as in government, uh, the Canberra Commission on, um, on uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons, which um, really began uh, for the first time a, a really serious normative enterprise of getting people to focus on the absolutely indefensible inhumanity, indiscriminate inhumanity of nuclear weapons and the absolute need to focus not just on their limitation, but their ultimate, um, on their, not just on their reduction, but their ultimate elimin elimination. And, uh, you know, that, that normative role is, I think, uh, something that middle powers like us can play uh, very successfully. Now, the, the downsides of my period, there weren't that many of them, but I mean, East Timor was a continuing nagging horror story uh, as we had to deal with the consequences of Indonesia's indefensible takeover in 1975, but having to live with that reality. Um, the Dili massacre in 91 being, uh, I suppose, the real low light and just trying to keep the, uh, you know, that relationship with Indonesia alive, which was so important um, against the background of, um, of that particular, you know, it was worse than an irritant, it was a tragedy. Um, there, were, there were other downsides, and I suppose one of them, uh, which influenced my, my later uh, post-politics uh, career a bit, was um, just that sense of impotence in the face of some of the things that did go actually badly wrong in the 1990s. And I'm talking mainly about the atrocity crimes uh, that exploded um, you know, in Rwanda, of course, in 1994, with the death of something like 800,000 people in a few short weeks. Um, and, um, and then just a, a year later in, in the Balkans in Srebrenica when 8,000 men and boys were, were taken out by uh, Serbian forces and, and just massacred outright. And just that, that sense of the absolute lack of consensus in the international community about how to respond to this, Australia's sense of impotence as a spe distant spectator, uh, that sort of stayed, stayed with me. But, um, you know, the, the upsides were, were great um, and the, um, the achievements, I think, were pretty significant during that period. So it was a real highlight of my professional life, unquestionably. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, talking about those appalling atrocities leads into our next question, which is that you currently co-chair the International Advisory Board of the Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect. Now, R2P is a very important principle in international law. However, some individuals are cynical of the tangible benefits of this doctrine and express concern that it allows states to pick and choose what situations to intervene in. What benefits do you see to the international community from the development of R2P 
And can you please tell us about your crucial role in its development? Well, I did play, I guess, a fairly central role in that, thanks to the Canadian government, which responded in 2000 to the challenge that had been laid down by Kofi Annan to the General Assembly, when he said very graphically and movingly, if humanitarian intervention is such an unacceptable intrusion on state sovereignty, then how should we react as an inter national community to gross and systematic human rights violations that offend every precept of our common humanity that captured perfectly what the dilemma was in a world that, as I just mentioned a moment ago, had been completely unable to reach any kind of consensus about how to respond to these issues. The global north talked the talk of humanitarian intervention, military intervention, but didn't very often at all even begin to deliver on that. And the global south hated the whole idea, whatever their anxiety about atrocities, they hated the, the, the idea of um, the big guys throwing the military weight around. They'd had too much imperialist experience. They were too proud and conscious of their own newly won independence and fragility to cope with that. So when the Canadian government responded to Kofi Annan's challenge by inviting me and a very distinguished African um, diplomat, Mohamed Sanoun, to co-chair this, this commission, it really was a, a pretty big challenge to, to try and find a way of creating a new consensus, a much more positive and productive consensus. And I think we, we did that. Our report was, um, was very, very influential. It basically did four things. It changed the language of the debate away from the right to intervene to the responsibility to protect, which on the face of it is just much more potentially acceptable language to a, a very neuralgic global south in particular who hated the idea of the right of imperial powers to do anything. Um, secondly, we, we broadened the range of actors in the debate. Rather than just focusing on the role of the military big guys, we focused on everybody's responsibility, the state itself, responsibility of other lesser states to assist states to, to be able to cope with um, internal situations that were getting out of control, and the responsibility of everyone, um, big, small, medium-sized, to, to join in finding ways of reacting to situations that were careering out of control. Now, the third thing we did, very, very importantly, was move away from just focusing on reaction to situations that were careering out of control and focusing on prevention. Uh, and focusing on post-crisis rebuilding, another form of long-term prevention. And in focusing on when, we, when it did come to reaction on other than military strategies, I mean, sanctions and naming and shaming and diplomatic isolation and the use of vehicles like the, um, you know, the newly emerging International Criminal Court and so on. Uh, the, the fourth thing we did, I think very importantly, which um, still hasn't borne fruit, was to identify very clearly if there had to be military intervention, what the criteria should be for that, both legally in terms of very clear recognition of the necessity for Security Council endorsement, but also prudential criteria of proportionality and last resort, and in particular balance of consequences that uh, the absolute necessity to for any military intervention to do more good than harm which uh, has not been a track record that's always been evident so that was what we did in that report and what was crucial of course was that it uh, notwithstanding the distractions of 9-11 and everything else that was happening around that time, it did gain an enormous amount of traction eventually in the international community to the extent that in 2005, uh, the General Assembly, um, sitting as the World Summit at head of state and government level, unanimously embraced the key principles of our report and uh, articulated this, this new norm of the responsibility to protect with its different pillars of responsibility that were involved. Looking back on what we've actually achieved over the last um, 17 years since then, um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed record. Um, I think we have achieved normative acceptance of that principle, and that's evident from just how few dissenting voices there are in these annual debates in the General Assembly and elsewhere about the, the concept. Even if some people pay more lip service than substance um, observe, you know, to it, um, nonetheless, the, the lip service is real. The normative impact, I think, is still very 
significant. I think there's been a significant number of institutional developments in terms of preparedness, civilian, military, to deal with the different aspects of atrocity, crime, prevention and response. Uh, 60 or more countries um, now have focal points so described, people within their systems whose day job it is to focus on emerging situations and, and appropriate responses. And the, the global center that I chair in New York operates as the, the secretariat basically for that. And there's a lot of ministerial involvement in that enterprise. Preventively, a third benchmark of, of um, success or otherwise of R2P, I think, um, you know, gets more, should have more attention than it does. The whole point about prevention is that when it works, nothing happens and therefore nobody notices. Um, but, you know, R2P has been very, very often invoked in a whole variety of potentially terrible situations in Africa and elsewhere. And, um, you know, diplomatic effort has been mobilized in a way that wasn't the case in the past, and things have been headed off at the past, and that's been very important. Where R2P has um, clearly been much more problematic is in effective reaction to situations that really have exploded out of control. There's been a whole series of them in Syria, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, uh, now, of course, um, Ukraine again, Yemen. Um, we just haven't done nearly as well as I, among the other architects of R2P, had hoped. And, uh, you know, partly it's a problem of um, lack of consensus in the Security Council and since events which would take us a long time to describe that went, went badly astray in, in, uh, in 2011 in Libya. Uh, partly it's just the, the universal difficulty of getting you know, people to agree on really serious and substantial measures, not least military measures in extreme cases. But, um, but I, I haven't lost hope. And I think when you look at the, um, the reaction of the world now to the, the atrocity crimes that are being regularly revealed in uh, Ukraine, with Russia's morally and legally indefensible uh, invasion there, I think um, you know we we shouldn't lose hope about the about the capacity of R2P to be a really energizing force in determining that um, you know the holocausts of the past aren't repeated on certainly on that scale. So it, it's it's work in progress. It's a mixed story, but it's one of the things that I'm sort of proudest, I suppose, of of having been involved in in developing. Because before R2P came along, I mean, it really was a, a totally consensus-free zone, as I've described. And now we have at least the beginnings of a of a systematic consensus, even though uh, operational delivery is is always very very difficult. Well, it's so good to get your insights into a fundamental principle of international law that. You played such an important role in developing my well i wish it was more of a principle of international law i mean it's um, we're still not there yet in terms of it being a fully fledged in all its multiple dimensions including the the ultimate reaction military reaction in the hardest of cases it's a bit hard to say there's um there's enough consensus about what to do in these situations for it to now count as a principle of customary international law, but we're on our way. And I certainly think it counts as an international norm um, of real utility and impact. But um, the legal, we certainly, certainly it doesn't have the force of a treaty and so on, but um, you know, we, we're getting there. And it, it is something that I hope the next generation of international lawyers will continue to uh, work very hard to pursue. That's all very true. On my final question about your career, you led the International Crisis Group from 2000 to 2009. Could you please tell us about the work that you did with this organisation and highlight the differences from working previously in government? Well, there's always a difference between even the most successful NGO operations and being in government. You are inevitably outside the tent rather than inside. You're not there when the decisions are being made. All you can hope to do is influence those decisions. But the International Crisis Group, I think, um, was, did become an extremely influential NGO, and it was um, a very sort of useful next phase of my career to be able to spend nearly 10 years in Brussels um, heading that organisation up. It started when I arrived, it, it was just a very newly established fledgling organisation with less than 20 people um, operating in um, you know, no more than a handful of countries in the Balkans and in West Africa. 
Uh, by the time I left, um, you know, 10 years later, we had, you know, 130 people working in 60 countries with a budget that had grown from about $2 million to $15 million. And um, we were regarded as um, a pretty influential sort of organization. Basically, we tried to do three things. It was a three-legged stool. First of all, to generate really field-based research and analysis, not just sitting behind computer screens in global capitals, but out there on the ground, uh, people doing the hard yards um, with language skills, with experience in those countries, and getting to the heart of potential conflict and actual conflict situations and identifying potentially workable solutions. Um, the second thing uh, we did was to translate that analysis into really clear and comprehensive policy prescriptions, uh, which were, were not just pie in the sky stuff, not just wish lists, but were built upon our understanding of the way the, the policy world actually worked. And the third thing we did was engage in high level advocacy, um, not just uh, putting out stuff in, in blogs and op-eds and and printed and otherwise distributed reports, but actually getting the substance of those reports into the heads of policymakers at the most senior levels, presidents and prime ministers and foreign ministers. It was helped by the fact that I as CEO had been a foreign minister and knew very well a whole bunch of people around the place that we were seeking to influence. So I was able to, to get in the door at least once um, to see these various people. Um, whether you got in the door again thereafter depended on the quality of your reporting and analysis. But, um, you know, we, we, we basically did have a very high profile during that decade and have, have kept it since, I think, in many ways through my uh, successes. I think um, some of the highlights of, of that period were the work that we did on the Iran uh, nuclear brief. And uh, we came up with the, um, the solution, which was eventually embraced in the um, the JCPOA, the um, you know, the um, the Iran nuclear negotiation that, that Trump derailed and that is now trembling again on the brink of uh, reinstatement, um, we um, you know, did identify with a great deal of clarity and depth you know, what it was that was needed to um, to get that that um, agreement um, in place in a way that would. Um, inhibit the Iranians from even thinking about moving to actually you know, production of nuclear weapons. And that involved an awful lot of movement backwards and forwards, second channel diplomacy going into Tehran. And uh, because the, the Americans weren't talking to the Iranians, the Europeans were, but uh, weren't really listening to what the Iranians were telling them. And, uh, and, and we and, and my colleague in this enterprise was Rob Malley, who's the US, now the US chief negotiator, um, trying to put that, um, that uh, agreement back on track. So that, that was very important. Also, I think the work that we did on the, the Middle East and the Israel-Palestine issue, um, it looks fruitless in, in retrospect because the situation there is as bad as it's ever been. But I think we, we did identify um, with a lot of very detailed analysis and reporting a way out of that impasse, which if we'd been able to just be a little bit more successful in our advocacy, particularly in the United States, I think it really would have uh, you know, borne some fruit. But, but right across the world in uh, our own region in Asia and Africa, um, we, uh, we, we did, I think, um, play a pretty useful role. And that was a, a nice way to, uh, to finish my my active involvement in international affairs to be able to do do something as hands-on as that. Sounds like such a worthwhile organization to have worked for. Moving on to a couple of slightly more topical questions. Firstly, Australia's relationship with China has deteriorated over recent years, over issues such as the Belt and Road Initiative, the COVID-19 pandemic and trade disputes. As someone who has so many decades of experience with diplomacy, why do you think this deterioration has occurred and how could it have been avoided? Well, I'm deeply troubled by the abyss into which um, Australia-China relations have descended. It's a relationship about which I've always been um, pretty passionate. I paid my first visit to China, in fact, back in 1976, um, way before I was um, actively engaged as a as foreign minister. Um, in that period between the death of Zhou Enlai and the death of Mao when the Cultural Revolution was still in full flight. And so I saw the worst excesses of the, the Maoist period. 
and then lived through professionally the emergence of China as a, a much more rational and engaged you know, player and uh, willing eventually to embrace um, key um, approaches to economic management and so on, which lifted 700 million plus people out of poverty. And of course, saw the, uh, the development of really quite intense relationship between Australia and China, uh, economically, of course, um, on a very large scale, but also politically. And I worked very closely with my Chinese uh, counterpart, Chen Chi Chen, on the Cambodian peace settlement, for example, and um, later on, on a whole bunch of other international issues. And um, it, it was a period of highly productive relations, even though we had the Tiananmen uh, massacre in, in 89, uh, you know, seriously derailing issues for some time. Nonetheless, um, you know, we, we did seem to be on a very positive path. Now it's become much more difficult to manage that relationship, obviously, with Xi Jinping in power being much more assertive and aggressive in the way China's positioning itself, much less willing to, uh, to play second filling fiddle to anybody. Uh, South China Sea, um, treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, the endless ongoing saga of Tibet, um, the terrible, terrible crackdown and uh, collapse of democracy in Hong Kong, and the continuing tensions over, over Taiwan have all made life pretty difficult. But we ourselves in Australia, I think, have made life more difficult than it, than it should have been. Of course, we've had to push back and stand up against um, the more obvious um, excesses and unacceptable behaviour of, of contemporary China. But I don't think we needed to uh, engage in anything like the, um, the zealous rhetoric uh, that has accommodated, particularly since Malcolm Turnbull's uh, time in office, our response to these developments in China. I think we've been uh, over obsessive about things like Belt and Road and some of the other things needlessly offensive and obstructive. I think we've been over neurotic about um, Chinese influence in Australia. This is not something you can ignore, you have to relate to, but don't overdo it. And certainly don't push it to the point where you're making as I'm afraid is the case, 1.2 million Chinese Australians feel as though they're sort of being seen by the government as, um, as fifth columnists. I mean, a lot of this stuff has just gone too far and we've got to restore some balance. The critical thing in our relationship with China is you've got to do two things simultaneously. You've got to stand up to China and push back against its over-assertiveness and unacceptable behaviour and make very clear where we stand on all those issues. Uh, but also we have to get along with China, not just economically, but because, you know, China is here to stay. It's a major, major, major superpower and player into the future. And we've just got to get that relationship um, much more balanced. We have to compete where we must, but we cooperate where we must as well. And there are plenty of areas for that cooperation. Climate is an obvious one. China's been a, a much more constructive player on a lot of other um, public goods issues like peacekeeping and so on than it's, it's been given uh, credit for. I think the thing with China is we just have to ride two horses. As someone famously said, if you can't ride two horses at once, you shouldn't be in the bloody circus. Well, I think that's what we've got to do with China. We have to simultaneously stand up to push back against uh, over-assertive, indefensible behaviour and make clear what we stand for and what we're prepared to work with others to resist. But at the same time, we do have to get along with China. We have to recognize the reality that it's not just a, a hugely important economic partner for us, as for so many other countries in our region, uh, but that it's here to stay as a really major, major great power um, that's going to be around for a very long time and whose behavior is going to be really critical in the way the world addresses hugely complex issues like climate change and you know, peace and security more generally. So we've just got to find a way of dropping back some of the, uh, the rhetoric, the overkill, looking for constructive ways through. And I'm, I'm confident that um, with a hopefully a change of government, as you would expect me to say, we'll approach this um, in a much more balanced and sensible 
sensible way, but it doesn't mean becoming China's patsy any more than as an American ally, we should become Washington's patsy in doing things that are indefensible in principle and uh, against our own national interests. It's a matter of being very, very conscious of what our national interests are and working very hard to, um, you know, to, to play a role which both um, competes where we must, but also cooperates where we must. Well, thank you. That was a very insightful answer. As we've already touched upon, throughout your career, you have been dedicated to preventing, managing, and attempting to resolve serious conflicts, including helping, helping implement the United Nations Peace Plan for Cambodia, and later in your role as president of the International Crisis Group. So considering the current war in Ukraine, how successful do you think the response of the international community has been to this crisis? And from your experiences, what is needed in good conflict resolution? Well, obviously what's happened in Ukraine has shocked all of us who really, I think, overwhelmingly thought this kind of naked, indefensible aggression was a thing of the past that any country minded to you know, invade a neighbor would be very, very conscious that the, the costs were out like, likely to weigh, way outweigh any conceivable uh, benefit. And uh, I, you know, most people simply did not predict that there would be anything more than continued pressure and salami slicing with Ukraine, certainly not an outright invasion. So we are where we are, and we've got to try to walk back um, from that. And I think, as always, you've got to temper your idealism with a, with a sense of, of realism about what the art of the possible is. And I think um, we have to just simply hope that the international reaction and the Ukrainian defense of its own integrity will combine to create a, a dynamic that will eventually lead to the resolution of this conflict. The international reaction has been more solid, uh, obviously, than most people thought was, uh, was going to be possible. And that's been very, very encouraging not just uh, the West, which has obviously been, uh, been very, very strong, um, but also through the United Nations, the, the big affirmative vote to condemn Russia, the uh, exclusion of, of Russia from the Human Rights Council and so on. Um, even though there's quite a few countries that are trying to have it both ways and abstaining and, and staying out of, the, uh, out of the contest. Nonetheless, that's been pretty important as a recognition that uh, this is a watershed moment for international relations and that if we, we blow it in terms of uh, not responding in a united and effective way to this really extraordinary assault on the fundamental principles of the post-1945 you know, world order, then uh, God help us all. So, uh, but nonetheless, you've still got to move from that combination of, of pressures to, uh, to, to stopping the, the carnage. And um, at the moment, that's quite hard because um, both sides are very dug in, but you always have a chance in, in diplomacy and international relations of resolving conflict situations where neither side really sees a clear path to absolutely outright um, victory. And that's the case here with Ukraine's uh, defense has obviously been far more formidable than Russia contemplated, but whether it's strong enough to you know, completely keep Russia from achieving major military gains, uh, you know, this is, is highly problematic. So nobody wants to, uh, you know, put pressure on Zelensky, who's played an absolute blinder to do other than, um, you know, put on the table the, the compromises that he is and Ukrainians are comfortable with. But I think at the end of the day, I mean, something that does not only uh, put Ukraine into the, the formal neutrality box, rather than becoming actually a full-scale member of, of NATO, um, something that clearly commits Ukraine not to acquire nuclear weapons, that's easy. Um, but it's also something that, um, that recognises the reality of the, uh, of the Crimean takeover by Russia, that probably recognises the, the reality of at least some um, permanent accession of the Donbass territories, either to independent status or to be part of Russia. But all of these things are... Um, are uh, are achievable through negotiation. I mean, obviously, the, the scale of the human suffering has been such that um, Zelensky doesn't want that, uh, that sacrifice to be in vain. 
but equally, um, he has to be weighing um, uh, the horrifying, you know, consequences of the conflict continuing. Everything comes down, I suppose, to uh, to Putin's psyche and uh, where his head is at. And clearly, he's still in some sort of czarist, imperialist mode, which is um, is making it very, very difficult for rationality to prevail. Even though I'm sure there are many people in Russia around him that would love rationality to prevail. But as always with these situations, I mean, regimes seem to be very, very secure, authoritarian regimes, until all of a sudden they're not. And, um, you know, internal developments can, uh, can explode. But failing that, I think we are looking eventually at some kind of negotiation, which um, won't be fantastically satisfactory, but hopefully will um, avoid the, the worst of the uh, kind of capitulations, which everybody wants to avoid. Uh, but at the same time, be enough to um, give the Russians a, a face saver to uh, to stop the conflict. But um, this is a really, really tough one. But uh, again, I'm you know, a little bit of my optimism has been restored by the way in which the um, you know the world has reacted to this, which has been. Um, I wish to God they reacted a bit more uh, a bit more potently to the Crimea in 2014 and Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Georgia around the same time, because that clearly gave some um, some sense to Putin that he could get away with stuff which he, he shouldn't have had. But um, we are where we are. We're edging towards, I think, some solution to this, but it's um, it's not been a, a happy saga. Yeah, well, thank you for those very insightful comments. And it was truly a tragic and shocking and very difficult situation. Moving on to your career advice, which I'm sure many students watching are eager to hear about. For many law students, achieving the career goal of working in international relations and international law can be elusive and confusing. What skills would you suggest that young people seeking to enter this field develop and what experiences are helpful for gaining entry level positions? Well, I love the whole idea of people wanting a career in international law, international relations, international diplomacy, international NGOs. And I really, really hope that this current and future generation of uh, ANU international law students, you know, make those career choices. But actually making them effectively operational is, uh, is not easy. Um, let's, let's face it. What I've always said to people when my advice has been sought about this is that there are three things you can you can you need uh, for a career to to take off. One is um, the necessary skill set. Secondly, is enough experience to at least get your your foot on the the ladder and make you an attractive hiring prospect. And the, the third thing is sheer dumb luck, which uh, you, know, you can prepare yourself in all sorts of ways, but just uh, the things don't fall your way. But look, in, in terms of skills, I mean, obviously, academic qualifications are critical and just maximizing the uh, extraordinary learning opportunities you, you've got at ANU, in particular with this uh, law course, international law in particular, just make the, the most of that. But beyond that, there's all sorts of other skills that you should be self-consciously focusing on developing if you want a career in, in this area. General knowledge um, is really pretty important. Um, just read and read and read um, in terms of um, you know, The Economist and, and, and a whole bunch of publications, not, not just social media, but in depth so that you, you do have a real sense of uh, the currents that are flowing in the wider world and you can respond articulately to you know, questions about your, your knowledge of them. Um, <coughs> do work, I think, do focus on the, the need to acquire a foreign language. It was, was one of my great deficiencies. I mean, I studied Latin for years at, um, at school and university and didn't do me much good in terms of any known um, current language, even though I can still recognize a subjunctive, I think, at 40 paces. But, um, but you know, do French or Spanish or Indonesian or something. Um, which demonstrates your your capacity to um, you know to work in other cultures. You don't necessarily have to be all that fluent, but it, it's just the whole business of studying a language uh, gives you that degree of, of cultural understanding and uh, engagement, which I think is, um, is is pretty important. And potential hirers will be certainly looking for that. Certainly, if you want a career in foreign affairs, that's what they're looking for your your capability in that area. Um, work on your communication skills, both written and oral. Uh, work on your on your social skills if you want a job in diplomacy. I don't want to overdo that, but um, you know, try not to eat with your mouth open is pretty important if you're going to impress um, potential hirers. 
um, work on sort of organizational skills. Um, that's that's pretty important. Um, and if you can, you know, and I'll, I'll come to experience in a second. But if you can if you can do things in the NGO community, for example, which which involve you in, in demonstrating your capacity to actually get things done, not just to write essays, but to organize events and outcomes and workshops and roundtables and so on. That's that's something which people are going to look to as um, as, as a as a highly admirable skill to have. So just do what you possibly can to acquire as a broader range of relevant skills as you possibly can. In terms of experience, I mean, that's always the hard bit. How do you get your, your first foot on the ladder? Well, take any job opportunity that arises, internships or whatever that give you, however demeaning they might appear to be and however insufficiently appreciative, appreciative of, your, uh, you know, of your skill sets and your contribution to humanity, getting that foot on the ladder and just demonstrating a, a really determined um, you know, desire to make an effective contribution to whatever organization you're in, whatever, you're, uh, you know, whether it's a business or anything else, um, that, that's pretty important. And it, I mean, we, we took very, very seriously internships at the International Crisis Group, and we, we offered 60 or 70 a year to people, young kids from around the world. And, um, and you know, obviously, we weren't able to give permanent jobs to to more than a tiny handful of them. But what we were looking for when we did uh, appoint people to entry level jobs was certainly people who'd worked with us and demonstrated a bit of competence and a bit of passion and uh, a bit of you know capacity to make a difference. So you know just get yourself visible as you possibly can. Uh, other other experiences I know I mentioned NGOs and organisational skills and, and developing sort of advocacy and communication skills in that context is, is can be very very helpful additions to your resume. And, um, and the other thing we we mentioned before about travel. I mean just just, I mean, just sitting in a bar and uh, tending bar in Phuket or somewhere is not going to add enormously to your uh, your stock of life experiences. But um, but traveling in the way that, that that I did, I mean, was was fantastically significant for me, and it just multiplies your uh, your, your sense of what the, the world is about, and just gives you a whole new set of ways of thinking and feeling about things, which if you can then develop a passion for that and communicate that passion to people who are, are interested in, um, in you know, hiring you, um, that'll, that'll make a big difference. But at the end of the day, as, as I said, finally, a lot of this does come down to luck. I mean, you can prepare yourself in every conceivable way, academically and all the other add-on areas that I mentioned, and then look and see someone else who's you know, maybe equally or maybe not as well prepared as you are, you know, getting a break that you, you feel should have gone your way. So, and that, that, that's life. I mean, that's many, many are called, but few are chosen to these, um, these jobs. So always, always have other irons in the fire. I mean, um, you know, have a passion that you want to pursue if you possibly can, whether it's going into foreign affairs or whatever, but if that doesn't happen, um, have yourself mentally prepared with a set of sort of fallback options, which might not be absolutely optimal, but nonetheless will still, you know, play to your your strengths and your passions, and then just um, keep your fingers crossed that um, you know things will will work out. So, in that context, may I wish everyone the best of uh, possible luck with their course and with their future career and. Um, uh, the future really is in your hands. I mean, people like me are not going to make any difference anymore to the, the world and the terrible condition that's now in. It's, it's the next generation's task to do just that. So um, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to your students. Those were such good tips, Gareth. Thank you. I'm sure many students will be writing down that list to work out what they should be doing. That concludes all of my questions for today. Thank you so much on behalf of the ANU International Law Society for making the time to speak to us. You have such a vast array of experiences and depth of knowledge. It was truly an honour to speak to you. Thank you. My pleasure again, Liz. Thank you.